I didn't know anything about the railroad. I didn't know that it tunneled under the Blue Ridge. I didn't know that it was called, this stretch of it was called the engineering marvel of the 20th century. The reason for that is the railroad comes up from the valley below us to the south, the North Fork of the Catawba, to the <clears throat> pass here at McKinney Gap and it comes up at a very slight grade, one foot every 100. Best crossing of the Blue Ridge for anything, man or beast, car or railroad, one foot and every 100 is a, is a gradual grade. But in order to do that up a steep mountain, it takes a lot of switchbacks going back and forth and around. And here, to get up in 14 miles of track, to go three miles as the crow flies, it took years of work. It took 18 tunnels to finally be completed, and it's called the Clinchfield Loop. Now, I was proud of myself after I learned about the Clinchfield Loop and found out that it was such an engineering marvel that uh, I uh, maybe was a little overconfident. A fellow from uh, England, a railroad buff from England came and stopped in and asked me if the loops were right around here. And I said, yes. And he said, do you mind if I ask you a question or two? I said, go ahead. Well. I found out after two questions, he knew more about the loops than I did. He was from England and he was a railroad buff. Mm -hmm. So the railroad right here is a marvelous piece of engineering and probably the most spoken of railroad construction site in the East. So I started learning about it. Clinchfield Railroad. They had a lot of trouble building this, not only coming up the slope like that, but down in the town of Marion was the Norfolk Southern, or that's what it is now, that was a east-west going railroad. And this railroad was a north-south going railroad. The east-west going railroad refused to let the south going railroad cross their railroad. And so for a long time, there was argument about it and finally a court case and the judge decided that the southbound train was due to have a crossing. So the Clinch Cross is a famous railroad site in Marion where finally the, the Clinchfield got freedom to go under the Norfolk Southern track. That's carrying competition a long way. <laughs> well, anyway, the railroad started the orchard. They, why you might ask, would a railroad have an orchard? Well, I have reconstructed the reason. I don't know if it's really true, but I believe it. There was no way to get apples off this mountain in the early part of the last century. You could grow them on the Blue Ridge. That has been a famous place all the way up into Maryland for, for apples. So they started an orchard here knowing it could grow apples and knowing the only way to get the apples to market was on the railroad. And so the railroad could profit even if they didn't own the orchard. And pretty soon they sold it. I guess the railroad didn't know as much about the orchard as they needed. And that is <coughs> kind of common today because the current manager doesn't know much about apples either. So the railroad came through here and that's why we bought the orchard to prevent the land from ever being developed. 
But in the course of this, the railroad has turned out to be a very interesting subject. In order to get workers, it used to be in the 1800s that they started off using slaves as railroad construction crews. And when that got thrown out, they started using prisoners as construction personnel. And the work was so hard and so underpaid, and finally, that was illegal too. So now, toward the end of the 1800s, the state of North Carolina had what they called a peonage law. And the peonage law said, if you go to work for a company and you get in debt to them, you can't quit until the debt is paid off. Well, the people that were recruited to work were largely brand new immigrants off the boat, either from uh, Charleston or from Pittsburgh or Philadelphia. And the embassies of the countries they came from were in cahoots with the railroad company. And since these folks didn't have the language, didn't have a job when they got off the boat, they were told that they could come to a very productive job at a good wage up in the mountains. The train brought them here. So they were indebted and they could not leave. They were not very popular here at all. Local folks did not like them. They were, a lot of them dark skinned. None of them or very few were from Africa. Most of them were from Eastern Europe. And they knew only their country's language. So camps were formed along the track on the basis of language. And so you would go to where you could speak and understand and work on that section of the railroad as it was being built. Someone came into the orchard uh, on one of the early days here and was talking about how their uh, dad had been a dynamiter in the tunnel here at, at Alta Pass. Well, uh, I, I knew right away that that was a modern story because they didn't have dynamite back in the day of the, of the tunnels. They had nitroglycerin and that was a pretty dangerous kind of a, a dynamite. And that's what they had. He said his dad had set off a blast in the, the tunnel. And I said, oh yeah, that's how you had to dig the tunnel. And he said, no, he did it deliberately and it caved in on six of them immigrants. Somehow that was a, um, a, a family pride even to this day. Well, those workers were badly treated not only by the peonage law, but by the railroad itself. And a lot of them died. There is no accurate count of how many worked and how many died. But when we bought the orchard, we found three graveyards on it. Charlie McKinney's was in good shape. You could see the stones. Some of them had some printing on them. And every so often, the McKinney clan would come and repair the, the graveyard, set the stones back up again, clear the underbrush, things like that. The other two graveyards were very difficult to find. One of them was 100 yards or so away from the McKinney graveyard, across a gully. And at, when I found it, it had about 10 stones left in it that were apparently gravestones. <clears throat> there was one on the other side of the Blue Ridge over in uh, uh, the Mitchell County, and there were no gravestones left. I got uh, a McKinney uh, to show me around. He lived over there, 
and he showed me where the his parents had lived and all that was left was the stone foundation of the house on the slope and he looked across the valley or cu culvert really uh, the gully and said that's where the graveyard was well i said how do you know he said well there were all those stones over there but now they're all gone and i said what happened to the stones he said a previous owner of the orchard came with a wagon and harvested all those stones many of them i guess soapstone which is was used as graves grave markers in the time so the the uh, laborers had a lot of trouble even after they were dead when the railroad was finished the foreigners were put on boxcars locked in and the train sent south i don't know what they did after they got to the terminal down south. But their legacy is present in the railroad. Here it is more than a hundred years later and it's still in operation. It was built very stout and it has survived. It was built to haul coal from Kentucky. The people that owned the railroad had access to a quarter of a million acres of coal land in Kentucky. And they had powerful reasons to build the railroad and get it all the way to Kentucky. When we bought the orchard in 1995, uh, there were still an awful lot of coal trains, night and day, running up and down running down the orchard, coming back empty to go get more coal. Each coal train had exactly 110 cars of coal. And 10 trains a day and 110 cars meant an awful lot of Kentucky came through this gap and down this track to be burned on the East Coast and some even shipped away from the East Coast. Well, the railroad also inadvertently brought the Industrial Revolution from the East and the South over the mountain. And the railroad established towns along the track and many of them still there and prosper. They had a big plan for Alta Pass. The railroad put a station here. The, the station was the main stop for passengers on the railroad, although they stopped here and there to pick up passengers, carrying them to and from uh, the area. But the, the reason that this was such an important station up here is in the name, Alta Pass. The railroad gave us that name, Alta Pass, High Pass. It's the highest point on the railroad track, uh, all the way from Spartanburg to Kentucky Coal. And so the railroad not only started an orchard, but they started a community. And they have it all mapped out what they were gonna have built. They had a golf course. Uh, they had a very nice hotel right across from the station. They had a bowling alley all of that and the railroad was uh, quite far-sighted in that because after oh 15 20 years they started s selling off these assets and they weren't town builders and they weren't apple growers and so they sold these lots and these uh, things that they had started and, and built to uh, private citizens. They knew that the apples had to be carried out somehow and trains were the only way <clears throat> back in those days. And this place was beautiful and it was mountain. And even though it was a low spot in the mountains, 
it got a lot of visitors.